I'm happy to be here and uh, come back to the NIH. I haven't been here probably for about 14 years now. Um, and uh, my, uh, my uh, talk is called Career Plasticity Leads to the Study of Neuronal Plasticity. And uh, a lot of the uh, themes that Dr. Hallett already touched on, I'll probably reinforce as well uh, in terms of uh, following the path that, that is the most interesting to you. I think that's a very important uh, point that uh, you should take on. Um, I was actually here as a graduate student, which I guess is still rare in this program, judging from the, from the show of hands earlier. Uh, I was, and I came back for three years. Uh, I was here from 95 through 97. Uh, and then I parlayed that into a postdoc as well. So I was here for an additional three years after that as well. So overall, I'd been here on and off for about six years uh, uh, working in uh, Dr. Grafman's lab. Um, and so I'm going to first address the, the first half of that title, uh, uh, career plasticity. Um, and uh, if you looked at the academic history part of my vita, uh, you might see that there are a couple places that might seem a little strange to you, uh, like uh, how does somebody with a, uh, with a bachelor's in music end up becoming a neuroscientist? Uh, and uh, I'll tell you this story in a second. And, and if you looked at this, there might be a couple different places where you might see that there might have been some plasticity in my career. Um, but uh, actually, it started even before that. Uh, when I was in high school, um, I ended up uh, really not thinking I would ever go to college. Um, I wasn't interested in college. It was the 80s. Uh, a lot of people were going to college for business degrees, and I had no interest in business. Uh, the, about the only thing I excelled in in, in high school was music. Uh, basically, because that's the only thing I really applied myself to. Uh, um, I was very interested in music. Uh, and when I graduated from high school, I actually uh, went on the road with a performing group uh, for a year and traveled 85,000 miles with them. Uh, and that really turned me on. I really was thinking that music was the area that I was going to go into. Uh, fortunately for me, I had a PhD uh, for a mother uh, who said to me, you will go to college and you will get an undergraduate degree. I don't care what it's in, but you need to go to college because it's going to do you some good in your life. Uh, little did she know at the time. Uh, so I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to school for music then. I don't want to go to school for business. I'm not going to get some other degree that's not interesting to me. I want to go study music. And she was on board with that. So I did that, and that was no problem at all. Um, and uh, so I got into Berklee College of Music. Uh, uh, and if you don't know much about music schools, Berklee College of Music is uh, probably one of the best jazz schools in the country. Uh, and it had an actual, it was very interesting because uh, Berkeley, uh, as a school, was a very easy place to sort of get into, but a hard place to stay. Uh, uh, and so I actually had two full suite mates of roommates uh, actually turn over in my first year at Berkeley. Uh, because if you didn't do the work, you went away. Uh, they had people who wanted the slots, and they were happy to take the money of anybody who wanted to come in and try. Uh, and I ended up getting a degree in music synth synthesis. My primary instrument was piano. Uh, but around my junior year of college, uh, it became very clear to me uh, that I was going to have to work really, really hard in order to become a, a, a musician or make a living being a musician. I was already practicing about eight hours a day, in addition to going to classes and everything else. Uh, and I knew people who played a lot better than I did, and they were still starving, and they were still struggling to make ends meet uh, as musicians, and that was a tough thing. Uh, and uh, so. That sort of took some of the fun away from it. It was no longer so much fun because uh, it was looking harder and harder to, that I was going to uh, be able to actually uh, uh, have a living in that. Uh, fortunately, around that time, uh, I got uh, very interested in these ideas of what is skill, uh, what is talent, and what makes some people better at things than other people. Uh, and I was really interested in that, and I, and I got interested in, in sort of how the brain gave rise to talent and things like that. What was the difference between talented people and non-talented people, or skilled people versus non-skilled people? Uh, and so I thought I wanted to go study the brain somehow. Um, and I had these really mystical ideas about the brain. Uh, I bought into a lot of these ridiculous notions that were uh, and are still out there, these left brain, right brain things, and, and this idea that you only lose, use 10% of your brain or something like that, and all of these other things. Uh, and uh, so when I started to look around for people, for mentors, uh, uh, I went to several psychology departments in, in the Boston proper area, because I was working there uh, after, uh, after graduating from college. And I went to talk to them about my ideas about the brain and about music and things like that. And uh, I actually got thrown out of a few offices. Like, you know, you need to go, you need to get some, you need to get some background. I actually, I remember that Margaret, Margaret Anton Peterson actually uh, sent me out of her office with a, with a copy of the Gleitman uh, introductory psych textbook and said, you need to read this. Uh, you need to take some classes. And 
and uh, then maybe go talk to somebody else, basically, was what she said. Um, I don't think she wanted to see me again. But any, anyway, so I went back to Colorado, and I took some background classes, and I found a kindred spirit. I actually uh, ran into a psychology uh, professor who uh, uh, was also a musician and uh, actually had played his way through graduate school in Wisconsin by playing drums in the jazz clubs in St. Louis. Uh, and so he was much more tolerant of my sort of mystical ideas about music and, uh, and the brain and basically said, you need to get a rigorous scientific background in cognitive psychology. Uh, the stuff about the brain is all interesting. That's an upcoming field, and you can probably get some, some uh, you can probably, you know, uh, supplement your training here by doing some other things to, to learn some brain techniques. Uh, and so I did, and this is why I came to the NIH, is I came to the NIH to, uh, to supplement my training as a cognitive psychologist by learning some of the more cognitive neuroscience sort of methods. And this was the beginning of uh, the time of functional MRI. A lot of the time I spent here was actually uh, starting out doing comparative analysis across different packages for functional MRI analysis. Um, and uh, and uh, that was very interesting to me. And I stayed here uh, for those three years. Um, I did a, came and did a postdoc, as you'll see here, uh, after that. Um, and I was think, thinking I was on my way to, uh, to go work at a big research institution and uh, you know, basically do research for the rest of my life. Uh, and uh, that's where the sort of second place of, uh, of uh, career plasticity came in, is uh, I was recruited by Union College uh, quite persistently, actually, uh, in uh, my third year, actually my second and third year, they brought me in for an interview and uh, offered me a job, and I turned it down uh, because there was really didn't seem like I was going to be able to do the type of research that I wanted to do. Uh, but they came back a year later and they said, well, you know, on paper, Union College is the same institution as Albany Medical College. And there's this new chair of neurology coming in. He wants to get a three Tesla MRI scanner and wants people to come use it. And he wants to talk to you. So why don't you come back up and re-interview? And I did. And long story short is that I, it ended up working out. And they offered me a job. And I ended up uh, not only uh, starting a neuroscience program, which is what Union College wanted me to, to do, but also being in, in the ground floor of uh, uh, the beginning of, a, of a, an advanced neuroimaging uh, facility as well. Um, and so, again, this is not where I might have ended up had I thought about where I was going when I was doing this other stuff, uh, but it was this openness to sort of uh, change and plasticity and following these different routes that has sort of led me here. Uh, and I was the director of the neuroscience program for the first eight years. I was the founding director. That culminated with a million dollar grant from the NSF, and we built a center for neuroscience at Union College for training uh, undergraduates in, in uh, cognitive neuroscience and across all levels of uh, neuroscience as well. So um, that's sort of the career plasticity end of things. And so I, I thought I'd give you a sense of the type of work that I'm doing as well. Uh, and it turns out that that sort of stems uh, from the NIH as well. Uh, when I was here in 95 uh, or 96, uh, this particular paper came out, and you'll see that uh, Dr. Hallett was, uh, was uh, one of the key authors on this paper. Uh, you may or may not know this paper, but this is a paper that showed basically that people who had been uh, blind from birth uh, had recruited the occipital cortex of the brain. The occipital cortex is the area of the brain that's associated with uh, visual processing in most people who have sight. Uh, but these blind people had recruited that area of the brain for uh, processing Braille and doing Braille reading. Uh, and this was a very exciting paper when it came out. It was one of the first papers that showed this, uh, this type of plasticity. Um, and uh, it was really exciting to me uh, because this is really what I was interested in. Um, I was really interested in these ideas of skill. And from the cognitive point of view, we know that skills go, uh, are due to changes in behavior that occur across a period of time, a period of practice. And it suggested to me that there had to be some brain changes that occurred as well during those, during those times as well. Uh, however, neuroscience had sort of not really thought too much about plasticity. In fact, there was this idea that the brain was set once you're an adult, and there really wasn't much change that went on. So I really got uh, set on a path to looking at, uh, at neuroplasticity by a paper like this and working with Jordan Grafman, one of the other authors as well, and that's who I did my postdoc with. So I'll give you some examples of where I started and what we're doing from now, uh, from uh, more, uh, more recently. Um, when I think about neuroplasticity, it's important to think about uh, uh, the term itself. The term itself is a sort of general term that's used across a lot of different levels in neuroscience. Uh, and so at the cellular level, people talk about it in terms of long-term uh, potentiation, long-term depression, synaptic remodeling, all these other things that happen at the cellular level. Um, but I'm interested in the systems level sort of neuroplasticity, so how 
large-scale neural networks change across uh, some sort of, uh, some, some, some sort of uh, phenomena in, in the brain. And so I was thinking about skill learning, as I said, but uh, we can also talk about large-scale changes in neural networks that are associated with recovery of function after brain injury. I'll give you some examples of that. And most recently, we've worked at looking at changes uh, in, uh, in large-scale neur neural networks that are involved in things like psychotherapy and treatment for neurodegenerative disorders. And I won't be able to talk about this. I'll run out of time. But uh, we're also now looking at how we can use plasticity to do things like diagnosis of neurodegenerative disorders as well. So <laughs> one of the first places I started with this was uh, in the third year as, a, as a, a summer intern, as a graduate student, in the first year of my postdoc, I got to study this really interesting case. And one of the things I really loved about the NIH was number one, being able to bring in these cases, as Dr. Hallett said. Uh, you have these resources to be able to bring in these cases, but also you have these resources to be able to study these really interesting cases as well. Um, and there are not a lot of places in the world or in the country that actually have access to the types of resources that you do in this particular, in this particular place. So I would, I would suggest that you really should take advantage of those things if you can, uh, because it, it really allows you to do some things that you may not be able to do after uh, being at the NIH. Um, and I can talk more about that in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the panel if you want to. But, um, so this is a case. This is case GK. Um, GK was 67 years old when I first met him. Uh, however, he had suffered two massive strokes uh, in his 50s that basically uh, uh, or virtually redu uh, uh, destroyed his whole left hemisphere. So it's from these sort of dated MRI images. You can see that most of his left hemisphere of his brain has been destroyed by these two strokes. And, Miraculously, he actually lived through these and lived for a long time. And you don't usually see that with people who have giant strokes like this. Uh, after his strokes, GK presented as what we call a global aphasic. So this is somebody who cannot produce or understand language at all. Uh, and so he underwent quite a bit of post-stroke rehabilitative language training. Um, and he was able to be reclassified as what we call now a Broca's aphasic. A Broca's aphasic is somebody who can understand language very well. In fact, he could understand me if he were sitting in this room right now, uh, even though I tend to probably talk a little too fast, uh, he could understand me fine. However, he could only produce one or two word utterances um, uh, and respond to language. And so uh, he wasn't able to use language fully. Uh, probably one of the most expressive people I ever knew with one or two words, but a uh, uh, pretty interesting case. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at what areas of the brain were involved in his uh, recovery of function with language, going from a total aphasic to a bro Broca's aphasic. And we did a bunch of studies with him. I mean, we did PET, we did fMRI, we did some TMS to confirm some things as well. But basically what we found is, is on this, uh, is, uh, summarized on this slide, is uh, this is a functional MRI study where people are just reading words in the scanner. Um, and uh, in the controls that were age and education matched, you see this activation in the left temporal lobe, basically where you'd expect it to be. Um, but in GK, you see an activation in a roughly homologous area in the right temporal lobe. And what this suggested and what we were able to sort of make a good convincing ar argument for was that uh, this was due to what we called a homologous area adaptation, where uh, the language processing had moved over into the right hemisphere. Uh, and so that's uh, one of the things that we could make a, a case for in this particular uh, study. Um, after that, I was really interested in uh, trying to pursue this interest of mine in looking at skill learning. I wanted to know whether we could actually see these types of changes uh, in people who, had, uh, who were unimpaired. Could we look at changes in the brain that were associated with unimpaired, unimpaired skill learning? And we used a task that had used, been used quite a bit in, uh, in the cognitive psychology literature because we wanted to use something that was very controlled. Uh, we used this pseudo-arithmetic task. Uh, we call it pseudo-arithmetic because it's very similar to uh, regular arithmetic. So uh, for example, in a regular uh, addition, you'd get a problem like 3 plus 3, and uh, children would start out solving that problem going 3, 4, 5, 6, and 6 would be the correct answer. Uh, and then they, with enough practice, they would get to the point where, like all of you, if I asked you what 3 plus 3 was, you probably just remember it in your, in your mind, oh, it's 6. So you just retrieve the answer from memory. Well, this is a similar task, only it's based on the alphabet, not on the number line. So with a problem like A plus 3, you go A, B, C, D, and D is the correct answer to that particular problem. The great thing about this is this is a, a task that people have no experience with when they come into our studies. And so we can study the, the changes in the brain that are associated with learning this new cognitive skill. 
And we presented it in a verification format where we gave them a candidate answer and they just had to say if the answer was true or false for the problem. We also know from the extensive behavioral literature that people also uh, uh, with training will switch from counting up in the alphabet to being able to retrieve the answers in memory much like they do in regular edition as well. Uh, and so um, we looked at this uh, in a couple different studies, one with functional MRI, one with EEG, uh, 10 participants with EEG, 20 with fMRI. Um, in the EEG study, we did pre and post training uh, uh, EEG sessions where we recorded EEG while they were doing this task, uh, both before and after. Uh, and in the imaging study, we actually collected three uh, time points where we collected data uh, in the beginning, the middle, and the end of, uh, of training. Uh, basically, they were trained over a week. Uh, in, for example, in the EEG study, they, they practiced these problems over 96 blocks over six days, um, 16 blocks per day, of, uh, and a block is one time through the whole problem set. Um, and they studied a little less in the fMRI study, um, and we had problem type, as I talked about, true or false, where they were presented with a true or false answer. Uh, we had a measure of uh, problem difficulty uh, and some measures of, of answer probe magnitude, differences between the candidate uh, uh, false answers and the actual true an answers. We didn't talk about that too much. We also looked at what strategies they reported using, uh, randomly probing them 25% of the time and asking them what, uh, how they'd solve the problem, whether it was by counting up or whether it was by memorizing the problem. And what you see is the res results from the fMRI study and from the EEG study. And basically, these are to show you that they actually did learn to do the task. You see here is reaction time speed up across blocks, so people got faster in both cases on the top. Uh, the middle here in the EEG study shows you the increase in accuracy that occurred across blocks as well. And then the final uh, panel in both cases is the proportion of use of the two different strategies. So as you see, uh, proportion of counting up here goes down, while the proportion of memory, uh, memory retrieval goes up. And the basic difference between these two lower panels is that this one is people are trained much farther out than they are in this case. But in both cases, they're learning, uh, they're learning to do this new task of alphabet addition. So what did we find in terms of changes in the brain? Well, first of all, in the fMRI study, there's a lot of things that we found. I'm just going to pick one, going to sort of cherry pick one finding and, and, sh and show it to you. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the task map. This is the map that I would look at if I was just doing functional MRI and I said, I want to know what areas of the brain are involved in doing alphabet arithmetic. Might not be a very interesting uh, question because nobody does alphabet arithmetic, but we wanted to do this as a baseline to see how things changed. And so we had a network of areas in the brain that were involved in that that included the left inferior frontal gyrus, left cingulate, and right parahippocampal gyrus. And so these were the areas that were involved in doing that task on the, on the very first day. And now we can look at changes that occurred as people learned the task. And one of the key findings that we found is that we found a linear increase in activation, meaning that this, these areas increased in activation across the three, the three imaging sessions. And it's a very different neuronal network, uh, a network that includes the right insula, left medial frontal gyrus, and left transverse gyrus. And so this is a, this is a network of, uh, of uh, areas that are sort of becoming online as people learn these representations for the problems and learn to use memory retrieval to answer these problems. And so the main thing about this study is it showed that we could track these changes in the brain and we could see changes in the brain that were associated with learning a new skill. And that was uh, very important at the time. Um, we also looked at this uh, in two ways in the EEG study. We looked at, uh, first of all, we did analysis in, in the standard ERP way, looking at the time domain, looking at peaks. Uh, so we looked at this peak here at 300 milliseconds and another peak here at 500 milliseconds. And because of the results, I'm not going to be able to go into them too in depth here, but, but the results suggested that this change that occurred in the 300 millisecond uh, peak was due to changes in attention, whereas changes that occurred in the 500 millisecond peak were probably due to the emergence of memory retrieval uh, that occurred across training as well. In addition to that, we found, uh, we did the analysis uh, uh, in the frequency domain, looking at oscillations at different frequencies. Um, and we found uh, a theta synchronization. This is an increase in power at the theta frequency band uh, that we found that was, again, this was a, a finding that was associated with memory, uh, the uh, emergence of memory throughout the skill learning. And then we found a beta desynchronization. This is a decrease in power at the beta frequencies. 
uh, that uh, was associated with, uh, with uh, attention. And the key thing about this is that we find four markers. Two of them are associated with attention. Two of them are associated with memory. Uh, but the interesting thing about this particular study is that if we looked at the overall spectra, so this is the frequency domain again, if we look at the total spectra, and then we look at the spectra after we've removed the time-locked component, the component that we were looking at when we were looking at the e ERP analysis, is when we remove that ERP component, we don't see any change between the spectra in both cases. You shouldn't see much difference between these two graphs. And what that suggests is the time lock component and the, uh, and the frequency domain component are actually independent of each other. And so we have, although we have these four markers that seem to be marking the same thing, they are not. They're, they're somehow marking different aspects of memory and different aspects of attention. And so this is one of the things that we're following up on as well, is trying to see if we can, if we can use these markers to get a better sense of, of, the, of the different aspects of those, uh, of those two different cognitive processes, attention and, uh, and memory. Um, I'll move on here uh, and talk about some more recent work. I think I'm running out of time. Am I running out of time? I don't see Mary, but OK. Uh, uh, this is some new work that we've been doing uh, looking at treatment, looking at uh, changes in the brain that are associated with treatment for a neurological disorder called tinnitus. Tinnitus is a disorder of uh, uh, a constant ringing in the ears. You see this a lot of, uh, with people who have been exposed, exposed to loud noises. You see it a lot uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, Gulf War vets, people who have been exposed to blasts and things like that. Uh, and TMS is transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's a way of stimulating the brain from outside the skull. I can talk more about that as well if you have a question. Uh, but basically, we were stimulating outside the skull over the left auditory cortex in 25 adults with an etiology of noise-induced tinnitus uh, and also hearing loss, which usually go hand in hand. And we talk about that more later if you want as well. And we stimulated these people with both what we call real stimulation and what's called a, a sham stimulation. Uh, so we had a sort of a placebo as there, in there as well. And we collected measures, uh, behavioral measures of uh, the tinnitus uh, symptoms, both uh, measuring the loudness of the ringing that was occurring in the ears and also some of the emotional effects of tinnitus as well. Um, and we looked at the result, the changes that were associated with uh, um, this stimulation in two different ways. First of all, we used magnetic resonance spectroscopy to look at uh, uh, the distributions of different metabolites. And uh, the one that was most interesting is we looked at the glutamate uh, change over the left uh, temporal lobe versus the right temporal lobe. And we saw that with stimulation, what happened is there was a, a, uh, a downregulation of glutamate, meaning there was less glutamate uh, in, the, in the left temporal lobe uh, after the stimulation than before the stimulation. And, and this is, uh, is consistent with what you think with theories about tinnitus that suggest there's an overexcitement of that particular area, and that's what leads to the, to the ringing in the ears. And so if you remove some of the glutamate, we also see that that was associated with symptom uh, with uh, with symptom uh, alleviation as well. And you see that here, that the change in the, glut uh, the glutamate uh, ratio, uh, as that change went up, the change in the loudness level also went up as well. So people's, the ringing in the ears actually got uh, decreased over, uh, uh, over time, or, or along with the, uh, the, or the change, I'm sorry, the change in glutamate uh, that occurred as well. So again, this suggests that uh, TMS led to less glutamate and also led to alleviation of the symptoms. OK, uh, and I think, uh, well, I'll just go through these two things really quickly. Um, we also looked at volume changes in the brain as well. Um, and uh, we, looked, we saw both gray matter and white matter changes uh, in the brain that were associated with the TMS. Uh, so these are volume changes, uh, again, another type of neuroplasticity. Uh, and then we also looked at correlations uh, between uh, uh, symptom alleviation and uh, volume in different areas of the brain. And this, what this suggested is that people who had uh, increased volume in particular areas of the brain prior to being stimulated had a greater uh, alleviation of the symptoms uh, due to the TMS. And this could be a very useful thing because it could be a way of figuring out wh which patients will react the best to that sort of stimulation. Uh, and that was an important finding here as well. Um, I'll close by just saying uh, thanks to Jordan Grafman and the NINDS. I should also thank Lyle Bourne, my graduate school advisor, because uh, without him taking me on as a sort of mystic, I probably wouldn't be here. Uh, and I would also thank uh, Anthony Cacasey, Dennis McFarlane, my uh, more contemporary uh, uh, collaborators, and of course, all of the students who have worked on all of these projects uh, at Union College and at Albany Medical College. Thank you.
anybody have any questions? Any questions? Yep. Yeah. Frequency? Yeah, it was one hertz, so it was low frequency. Uh, 20 minutes per day, six days uh, pre and post. And we did, so the sham stimulation is a stimulation that you use a different coil, but it gives you that tick on the head, and it also, uh, um, it also makes the noise of the regular stimulation. So uh, the patients didn't know whether they were being stimulated or not because they had this sham stimulation. Um, we can talk about that more as well because sham stimulation, we also found some changes that were associated with that, which was sort of interesting as well. But, couldn't talk about that too much. We, you know, that's a, it's a good follow-up study, and it'd be good something to look at. I mean, we use the one hertz because it's very, it's very safe. Um, so I don't know. We, I don't have an answer for that, but it's a good question. Uh, if I understand the correct, I mean, if I understand your, I may give you a wrong answer, not based on your, uh, on your, uh, my understanding of your question, but um, the temporal resolution with fMRI is, is relatively poor. So trying to find a temporal, you know, some sort of temporal modulation is, is going to be difficult because it's, we're looking at things that are averaged across, across, way across that time that we're looking at in the EEG. And that, that's one of the reasons that using fMRI and EEG is nice, it's a nice combination because the EEG has that great temporal resolution, uh, but lousy spatial resolution, whereas fMRI has the opposite of that, right? Does that answer your question? Is that what you're asking? Okay. <laughs>